Um, you're both wrong. I would say <laughs> you're equally equally wrong. Nobody was very close. Or Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Shellcast. I'm your host for today, Chris, joined by my brothers, John. John, how's it going? Um, this is great. This is such a great day. How's your and, How's your Wi-Fi, John? There's no. I don't get it. There was no countdown. My Wi-Fi. It's like, wow. It just there's so much Wi-Fi in here. It's crazy. You didn't see the countdown video. That probably means you're no. going to lag. <laughs> no, I didn't. It was just I was looking at your ugly mugs. <laughs> So did we start? Right. I don't know. When well, do we welcome clap? Welcome back, Andrew. Um, as you can see, some technical difficulties we're having, but we're going to push through. So we've got a lot to cover today's episode. Uh, it's the season finale of season one of the cartoon. We'll get through that. We've got a new segment, Turtle Tech, we're going to bring to you guys. We've got a snake draft. Uh, we'll probably tweak up the villain power rankings, a lot of stuff to get through. Um, so the first thing we're going to start with, as always, pizza time. Pizza time. Everyone's favorite segment. I spun the wheel last episode and landed on Raisin Brand Pizza. So I have a piping hot piece of pizza right here. <laughs> Looks like um, there's a bite missing out of it. Cooked it. <laughs> put, put some Raisin Brand right on. On at, it, uncooked. It smelled really good when I put it on. It's kind of got that cinnamon smell, kind of like cookies. So we're gonna take a bite here. Perhaps a cookie pizza. Hmm. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's good to me. Delicious pizza. You can really get the crunch, the sweetness of the raisins in there. Nice salty, sweet type thing going on. So what's <clears throat> what's the backstory here with the uh, raisin brand as a uh, non trademark? Yeah, so I went to the store just to, well, you know looking for raisin brand. There's a post raisin brand and a Kellogg's raisin brand. So I don't know the difference. It's I guess technically I bought raisin brand crunch. But the the phrase raisin brand does not appear to be trademarked. So it looks yes, like anybody um, can use it. Maybe it has like for example Maybe it's too generic. Um yeah. what's the orange soda? Sunkissed. Sunkissed. Yeah, like Sunkissed in Central Mass is distributed by Polar, but in eastern Massachusetts it's distributed by Coca Cola. Well this this says raisin brand they tried to apply for a trademark in nineteen forty four, but the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit basically said, since raisin and bran are ingredients, you can't trademark the name because you're just saying what it is on on the package. So that's interesting. I think, probably it has. I just googled it. Kellogg's has a little R after it. What does that it's mean? Reserved. It, everyone thinks of like when you think raisin bran, you think Kellogg's. So Post just got owned, I guess, in the raisin bran game. But it is surprisingly good. You get a little bit of texture. It's kind of like a savory, I guess most pizzas are savory, but we'll savory and sweet. Um, kind of like a oatmeal raisin cookie if you like those. But we're going to get right into the episode. So this episode uh, titled Shredded and Splintered, um, released January 1st, 1988. So New Year's. Um, and we start off with the, um, the theme song. So this, the theme song makes a return first time since episode one. We get the full intro, which I'm a fan of. Um, I wonder yeah. how much how much of that was just when they cut it for streaming because you 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 watch it on oh, Apple yeah. TV, right? I get it through Amazon. Prime. I did Apple TV. Okay, so so maybe then it's just uh, I don't know. It's weird, but I'm glad that the the intro theme song is back. Very happy. Well, you, usually um, TV, especially like you know, this isn't a sitcom, obviously, but. 20 minute TV shows like they've got commercial time and then depending on how long the actual episode runs they'll either increase or decrease the intro video so it might just be that the first couple of episodes or the middle episodes I should say just ran long where they didn't need an intro they're going right into it possibly maybe. it is interesting it was the first day and last episode maybe just coincidence but um so we get right into this episode it opens we've got the turtles back in the sewer they're watching TV they got the news on, um, and basically they're watching 
a news report on themselves. So recapping all the events of the week or the last couple of days, um, and they are dubbed the Green Menace. So obviously not enjoyed too much by the public. Uh, there's a little interview with the military who, who almost looks like a German military officer. But um, he says his orders are to blow them out of the sky if he sees them. So right away, a little bit of trouble in, in the public eye. Yeah, and they do show the clip of the tornado that was eaten up in New York City. Least destructive tornado, I think, ever. It yeah. really wasn't even doing much. It was just zipping around. So, Yeah, what was the tornado? That was early. So the other comment on the opening scene, um, to kind of piggyback <laughs> last episode, super artsy. They went for another angled, you know, like 90 degree rotated angle coming down a skyscraper building and it rotates back to normal view. So, uh, but yeah, the tornado, what was that in reference to again? Because that was right in that opening scene and it was, was it Havoc or was that throwback to um, some of Krang's tech from Dimension X and all that stuff? I think that was the weather maker. Yeah, I think yeah. the weather maker. Oh, yeah, that's right. Coming out. yeah, that's right. So T- total chaos. So they, they watch the news story. April gets a little bit upset that she's not the one reporting it, even though she's basically just been in the sewer for a week and not going to work. Um, so they decide, listen, now's the time. They kind of sit at the last episode. Leo knows it's the time to go after Shredder. So they start walking into the little turtle vault they have with all their weapons and what appeared to be a treasure chest in the corner. I don't know if you guys saw that. But um, they're standing in the little weapons vault and they kind of formulate their plan. So... The Turtles and Splinter decide to go after Shredder. Uh, They send April off to kind of put a news crew together and get them a little bit of good PR. And they hand her the Turtle Communicator, which we'll get to in a second. And they give her the the keys to the Turtle Van and then basically say, hey, listen, you go do that. We're going to hop in the Neutrino car and go deal with uh, with Shredder. So right off the bat, we're going to start with Turtle Tech here. This kind of opening opening segment, a little bit of trivia, a little bit of history. Um, so the Turtle Communicator, which at this point we know to be basically a two-way wireless communicator. Um, John, I'm going to start with you. Do you believe that this technology was available at the time of the episode release? When you say available. Could it have like, reasonably been invented by the Turtles? Yeah. At this time. Uh, I believe yes, it could have. Andrew? Yeah, I think the... So it's it's uh, essentially like a cell phone, flip phone, which I think in 88, I, that was at least developed for the military, I think. Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to say have, it's got to have been around. We have little... The army men, there's the radio, radio guy, little army man action figure. So wireless yeah. communication is 100% Ooh. available. You both kind of circled around it. So there's two. I looked at this two ways. Was it a cell phone? Was it a walkie-talkie? Yeah, walkie-talkie is the other thought I had. Yeah, so walkie-talkie was definitely around. John just kind of alluded to it. So invented, walkie-talkie is invented in 1940, right about there, by the U.S. military and Motorola uh, for World War II. So those little, those little army men with the backpack, that's the original walkie-talkie. It was actually called a handy-talkie. I was going to um, say, the name <laughs> of a walkie-talkie is like, like, yeah, so what that, is that? That backpack made it a walkie-talkie where you could actually walk around, <laughs> even though I think it required two men to operate, one to kind of wear the backpack, and then one to make the phone call. Um, the first cell phones, right around this time, so 1985 is when they started to make an appearance, but the the, the cell phone everybody knows from the 80s, like the big brick one, um, actually released in 1987 that was the nokia city man which was um just that it looks like a giant basically cordless telephone what was that um what was that show on comedy central where they would do like public pranks and they had the guy that had the giant cell phone and he'd be walking in the park just yelling into it oh yeah and then they would dress up in like squirrel suits and run around yeah it was a good yep i remember the show i can't think of the name i don't remember that show was awesome um so anyway they give her the turtle communicator they send her off on her way um and basically the second after she leaves the turtles get a broadcast cut into their television 
they walk back over to it and it's none other than shredder on the tv um saying he has a retro mutagen ray generator which basically looks like a regular pistol or handgun that uh, undoes mutation so he demonstrates it on one of his goons um turns him from a mutant goon back into a, a regular punk and then that's basically correct. says if, if you want to come get it to the turtles yeah that's uh th- i think third appearance of scrag so he uh he w- was like a bat or yep. some weird yeah like a bat that, that gets turned back into a human i think the the <clears throat> tech is is cool i mean again is this a shredder invention or is this shredder using krang's technology I don't know, but either way, I would say based on everything else we've seen is probably a Krang invention that Shredder just co-opted. Yeah. Um, How can Shredder just tap into the turtles like TV feed? This was kind of like that uh, was it episode one or two where he just taps into like security cam footage across the city. Yeah. Yeah. Shredder. It's interesting that they have different, it's a different TV set than the one they were watching the news on. I don't know if you guys caught that. Yeah, because they left. That's I uh, when I rewatched the episode, I didn't realize they left what I thought was April's pseudo apartment or some some place. Then they walk through the sewers and then they get back to the lair and then they're watching TV and that's when when Shredder hops on. So yeah, I think I think Shredder with the introduction of the RM or RRG whatever you want to call this weapon. RMRG. I feel like retro mutagen is like a hyphenated word. Yeah. So this is actually round, this is, this is round two of turtle tech. So we'll start with Andrew. Andrew, do you believe this technology, the ability to mutate genes was available at the time of this episode? No, no, I think, I think that was all with CRISPR, which is like in the last, couple decades yeah the, the, i don't think there was gene manipulation you are both wrong. any manipulation big wrong by you guys so gene guns or bioistic particle delivery systems were invented in the mid 1980s right around 1985 and they had the ability to let me see here deliver exogenous dna rna and protein to cells by coating particles of heavy metal with a gene of interest and firing these micro projectiles into cells using mechanical force. And if you look these up, they look almost like a cordless drill. They're used primarily in plants, but they do have the ability to basically fire things into cells and mutate them in the mid 1980s. I mean, I feel like that might be a stretch because we're, we're unmutating. So we're sucking those genes out, aren't we? Okay. Well, I, we're just mutating cells. Are you not mutating a cell? You don't know I mean, this is retro. This is undoing the mutation. You don't know the mechanism by which it works. I don't know. You're right. I mean, how, yeah, but how effective, like, if we're firing genes into cells, like, that, to me, that's not gene manipulation. We're firing particles into cells to mutate them. That's literally what the, what the thing is. Oh, I feel it's like a I'm retro- mutating. That anything even similar existed, first of all. Yeah. Yeah, it I am surprised very by that. Sci-fi. And you said it in the 80s or the 40s? It's 1985. 85, yeah. So it would have been like brand new at the time of this. Basically. I'm, I'm going to say Andrew and I were right on that one. No, I'm going to say you're wrong. Um, so moving on. The anyway, turtles. well, before I was saying, I feel like Shredder is moving up in his villain villainility, his villainness, with the introduction of this retro mutagen ray gun. But we don't even I feel know like if he he's just... It. Well, I mean, he's like owning it, so he's just, I feel like he's moving up in my books in terms of being a villain. All right. I mean, that's, <clears throat> I guess that's your opinion. I don't know. I, <laughs> I would prefer something a little more concrete than just taking something and using it on TV. But I mean, what, what would Billy Ray, Billy Mays, what would Billy Mays say about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, so basically right Splinter, now, Splinter says, listen, Billy I Mays. need to get this gun away from Shredder because if he uses it on you, you're just going to be turned back into regular turtles. It'll turn me back into my human form. So their, their rough plan is basically go find Shredder. Him and Splinter will separate. He'll figure that piece out. And then 
it's unclear what the turtles will do from there. I guess go after Krang. Um, I just, yeah, I find it like the fact that they want to get Shredder or Splinter back to his normal form, but the turtles don't want to go back. It just, it, I feel like it's a weird dynamic. Well, yeah, and I, we've talked about it turtles. before. I know, but it's just like odd. And well, it's convenient too that somehow Shredder, unbeknownst to like the turtles' actual plan, because I don't think the turtles have told shredder that they're trying to unmutate splinter i could be wrong about that but i don't think that has ever been a conversation had between shredder and the turtles so he yeah. conveniently invents the thing or creates a thing or builds a thing that could achieve that and then i find it i mean i know splinter is like ha has a ton of integrity but i find it convenient where he's like well i need to go get this gun because you guys are at risk even though like his end goal is to get back to being a human, you know? Yeah. Like it seems a little, a little selfish. fishy. Yeah. A little fishy there, you know, but, uh, yeah. At the end of the so, day, I mean, yeah, I, I think more of the story being they're aligned in their goal. It's kind of wrapping up season one really well, because in episode one, we learned that their goal is to basically unmutate splinter, uh, episode five to end the season. There's a chance now that they can achieve that goal. So they kind of they kind of shoehorn it nicely. Exactly. So Shredder, who's in the in the Technodrome at this point, he gets off his little broadcast, and then he orders his his A one goons, Bebop and Rocksteady, to basically go find and destroy the turtles because he knows that they're going to come looking for him at this point. So <laughs> they take their little secret elevator. We get the view of that again up to street level. Um, Different to grab phone the neutrino booth. car, which Different is basically booth, just. Time. The, the neutrino car is just in a hole, I guess, in the in the street. They hop in, they fly it about five feet, and it immediately runs out of fuel. Um, Donnie pops the hood and says, "Oh, this is this is run by plutonium." So I'm going to go back to Baxter Stockman's workshop, get something to help, and then he just runs off by himself. Um, at that point, again, this is probably one of my favorite themes: is that immediately after somebody leaves a room, something like happens. Every time. So he runs off. The second he's off the screen, Bebop and Rocksteady show up. And um, a little fight ensues. The Turtles win and escape. But it was, I'd say, probably the best showing by Bebop and Rocksteady to date in terms of the fight. Yeah. High quality sneak attacks just to yeah. surprise the Turtles. The old and just like grab them by the shoulders <laughs> and toss them move seems to be effective. Yeah, and ring them by the neck. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, who is it? Uh, Homer, Be Bart. Bebop, I think for a while had Splinter just in in his hands, and then he got uh, you know cuffed into the trash can, and then Splinter is able to to fight his way out. But yeah, fight scene pretty good. I think um, we got a Cowabunga, Cowabunga as as the turtles are either getting into or, or first like taking off in the neutrinos car. So I caught mm -hmm. that one. Um, yeah, long, long fight scene. I think Leo, again, here, he's so practical. He announces, I think they are starting to tire. Like, he's, his, his cues within the story here and how they unfold, like, he's, they just always paint him as, like, very practical, pragmatic. And I, for some reason, it bothers me. I don't know why. Yeah, he's um, corny. He's, like, a very, yeah. he's, like, it's like he read a book on leadership and he's just doing everything. Yeah, says. yeah, he's very cliche is probably the best way to say it. <laughs> yeah. um, but that fight, that fight scene uh, at the end there, so Bebop and Rocksteady get dumped into a garbage truck, right? So they get yep. trashed and then somebody drives up a cement mixer. And this gets me to an age old question for Chris as a civil engineer. What is the difference between cement and concrete? So this is one of my biggest pet peeves. People use it interchangeably. Yeah. It should be cement, concrete, right? Concrete yeah, is the final product. Yeah. Cement is an ingredient of concrete. So basically it's, it's the binder. It's like a fine, it's, it's made of typically made of limestone mixed with silica and silt and that kind of stuff. But it's basically the paste that holds concrete together. Yeah. So if you have concrete, it has cement in it. You can technically use cement by itself, but it's like very fragile and chips apart. And so it's more of like a plaster. 
So Johnny, I'll tell him I, mean, I mean, yeah, I just like, yeah, like so if, this if is, someone has uh, a patio, if someone has a patio outside their house, that's made of cement to me. Concrete is like, you know, the concrete the sh- jungle the stuff baby. that you like, <laughs> the stuff that you put, um, that you used to like put your mailbox into the dirt. You mix up a bucket of concrete and it comes out all crappy. That's cement or that's concrete <laughs> to me. <laughs> That's so, from an accountant's perspective. One thing the on the first of a few fight scenes, actually, there's a lot in this episode. Yeah, one thing on there were a couple points in this episode that actually made me laugh out loud. When Leonardo cuts down the traffic sign and it hits Bebop or one of them rocks Teddy in the face, and then his two eyes are a red light and a green light, or a red light yeah. and a yellow light. <laughs> I like I chuckled to myself. I was like, that's <laughs> that's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I put that in there. Like the fight scene was long. Like this is probably the longest one, but it's very like kid friendly because of things like that where it's like cartoony, you know, like um, what was it? Uh, Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner. Like, you know, they're, you know, Big Hammer and then the Tweety Birds and all that stuff. So I f- it felt kind of like that. Like they're trying yeah. to make it more kid friendly, even though it's a fight scene. Yeah. It's like the classic villain, like, oh, he gets dumped in trash or like the con- I feel like the concrete pouring on someone is a cla- like a battle cliche whenever you're fighting in a yeah. construction zone mm-hmm. yeah and um, then um in this scene too um splinter was like nowhere to be found fighting he was just like yeah i think he, he fluctuates didn't. between like being in the midst of the battle and then just like tucking tail and running yeah then that comes back to like later <clears throat> later in this episode you know he's kind yeah. of like the shapeshifter is he there is he not like is he winning the fight is he letting the turtles learn how to defend themselves you never know yeah so from here they win the fight the turtles kind of take off and then we cut back to shredder at the technodrome and he's finally giving krang his new body so they agreed at the end of the last episode you know after all the failures he was going to do it we get you know your stereotypical frankenstein scene where he puts him in the body there's kind of lightning floating around um brings him back to life and he he makes it very clear um, two things. One, Crane asks for a molecular amplification unit to be added to the body. And Shredder's like, oh, what's that? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it. Just put it in there. So that gets added. That and conveniently makes just it clear a... that there's going to be a little bit of disorientation once Crane's transferred into his new body. So it'll take him a little bit, you know, to recover from the surgery, basically. And there's just a abs- like perfect slot to add the molecular <laughs> amplification right in the shoulder. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, oh, what is this thing? Let me just shove it in the shoulder and connect it. <laughs> so Crane gets kind of brought to life a little bit there. Um, and then immediately, again, the a literal turtle alarm goes off in the Technodrome that says, Turtles, turtles, they're on their way. Um, Shredder sends his foot soldiers out to the turtles to kind of slow him down or at least buy himself enough time to get Crane to recover before they, you know, do what they need to do there. So yeah. after I was just going to say yeah. the Franken, Frankenstein scene, it's got to be one of the most like o- overused, like cliche sh- scenes of all time. Yeah. And I should and, say Frankenstein's monster technically. Yeah. But it is like the anytime somebody is like being brought to life, they feel the need to have lightning involved. Yeah. And even the shredder with it. It's alive. It's yeah. alive. Yeah. And then so what do uh, we think, by the way, of Krang's body at this point, the body that was built for him? Kind of uh, weird, just a guy yeah. running around in red undies and some suspenders. <laughs> and the fact like, that he's in the torso and not the actual head is interesting to me too. Yeah, a brain in the belly, basically. But I'm I'm not a big fan of the uh, the android body on it personally. Like even way back in the day, watching this as a kid, I thought, yeah, I just I'm just not a fan of it. The proportions are off. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I always thought there was a um, glass thing to like protect Krang in the stomach, but it's just like this open cavity. Oh, it's open? I just assumed there was still like a windshield there. No. Yeah, it's open. that's lame. I thought it was like watching. I always just assumed that the android body, like the way that it sort of moves around, like its head turns when it's looking. So like can Krang see through this thing's eyes, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know how the tech works, but I mean, it is a huge upgrade because this is the thing that he's been arguing about with Shredder the whole time. So now he's finally got the body. So I'm curious what he's going to achieve with it, especially in this episode, because it's being brought to life. We're about like a quarter of the way in or less than halfway into this episode. So there's a whole lot of foreshadowing, I think, that's that they're setting us up for. Yeah. And, and also just some more... Uh, evidence for why shredder i think is increasing in his villain abilities he whipped up that body in a half a day yeah it's pretty quick like, yeah once he like, basically decided to actually do it yeah um so from there basically cranes are covering the turtles are they throw a grapple hook up into just a hole that's in the side of the, i'm assuming it's where the neutrino car came out last time it's kind of hard to say but there's just a gaping hole on the side of the technodrome so they throw up the grapple hook they all start climbing out come the foot soldiers. And then at that point, um, Splinter's like, hey, I'm going to keep going. You guys stick here and fight these guys off. Um, he climbs up the rope and the turtles drop down for fight number two of the episode. Um, this one a little bit, probably not as intense. Um, they kind of break a sewer line and wash away the foot soldiers with raw sewage down into a ravine that I assume just goes to the middle of the earth. It's kind of unclear where they get washed down to. But there's just like a giant crevasse there next to him. <laughs> crevasse. <laughs> Dude, like that. That's how you say it. Crevasse. Crevice. It's not a crevice. <laughs> um, we got I, as, as they're hopping down. So as um, so because during that scene, um, they're being pursued, right? So the foot so the, it cuts to a scene of the foot soldiers being down on the ground level, but Splinter decides to go up and and pursue the retro mutagen ray while the turtles drop down. So as they're dropping down, we get a go green machine. So that's a, definitely a turtleism that comes back. Cowabunga! Um, and I don't know who yells it, probably Mikey. I think it was um, him. But then, yeah, they're just slicing and dicing. Leo hitting the shit pipe and just <laughs> flushing them away. <laughs> Which, like, honestly, like, raw sewage is probably the worst thing you would want dumped on you. It's, like, yeah, like very toxic. Would it be that... Uh, fluid though is is my question. Yeah, it was I don't like know. High pressure sewage pipe. Yeah, basically. and it was a lot. There was a lot. It, it like carried him out like it was just water, but it was green. Yeah. So, um, and then and then as as uh, Mikey is sliding down the pipe, he he shouts Cowabunga again. Cowabunga! So we got two Cowabungas in this episode that brings us to six total. I thought, um, like I said, there were a couple things that made me laugh. So. Chris, we didn't cover it, but Donnie is in Baxter's lab and he's building something to help the turtles get to it. But he has the turtle communicator that he gives uh, Raph a buzz in the middle of the fight. So Raphael picks up and he's like, hello, <laughs> hello. And Donnie's like, hey, like, what's going on down there? And he's like, kind of busy at the moment. And Donnie's like, okay, I'll just call back later. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> <laughs> it, I feel like it made me laugh and then Raph goes on to punch and then when Donatello is in making this machine the cleaning lady for Baxter comes and she's like oh like don't mind me like I'm just going to clean up a little bit and and Donnie's like no you need to like get out of here and she takes out some Windex and just sprays it on his welding mask and then like wipes it and I just yeah. that also made me laugh <laughs> just like yeah so we were actually I was just about to get to that part because at this point this is like the peak of everybody being separated. So there's a lot of like cutting yeah. back and forth in this episode. So the turtles win the fight. It cuts to April in the newsroom. She's basically telling her boss that, Hey, I've been with the turtles all week. And he's like, Oh yeah, well you're fired. And then <laughs> basically she tries to blow up, blow up the building. If he doesn't give her a news crew. Um, so yeah, he's not, like, all right. not endorsed by the, by the pro safety podcast that we are. That yeah. we discussed so, last week. Like that's yeah. pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. I was so very happens. concerned about that. Yeah. We cut to Donnie in the lab with the cleaning lady scene. And then we cut back to Crane. Um, he's kind of waking up in his new body and he's like, Oh, I gotta I gotta contact my guys over in Dimension X um to bring them over. Then we cut back to the turtles, they're entering the technodrome conveniently find this control room where they're watching Krang on screen just kind of like waddle over to the portal and they immediately piece it together that hey he's going to bring back the rock soldiers 
Like we had to go find this guy. Yeah. At that point, Michelangelo, when they looking at the screen, Michelangelo's like, who is that weirdo? Yeah. <laughs> He's just like, again, this guy in red underwear that's like milling around the techno. Yeah. So like for the, for how big and like the, how much there's going on in the techno drum, it's like surprisingly empty and devoid of any people once you get inside. So yeah. I feel like they're always just wandering around, like bumping into stuff that they need. Um, so we cut from there back to April. She's kind of running out of the newsroom. She's got her crew. And then Vern comes out and he's like, hey, Vern changed his mind. You can't have that news crew. And she's like, well, it's too late. Like, you got to come with me and help me. And he's kind of hesitant. You know, I don't believe you. So she just opens the door to the van and is like, look, here's some technology. I'm obviously telling the truth. Why don't you hop in? And they kind of speed off. Yeah, she's like, okay. Funny. That works for me. And then, yeah, that's all the convincing you needed was basically just to see that there's a van with stuff in it. And then he runs off with her. Um, so they speed off. We cut back to Splinter now. He's in the Technodrome. He's kind of walking into this little room where he sees the retro mutagen ray generator sitting on this little pedestal and is what, you know, the most classic trap of all time. He goes to grab it. Turns out it's a hologram. It disappears, and then a hologram Splinter appears and kind Shredder. of multiplies himself. Shredder, yeah, sorry. Shredder, yeah. So you have Splinter surrounded by probably six or seven uh, Shredders, and it's basically like uh, you know the old shell game, which one of me is real um, when their fight begins. So the fight starts. He pretty much immediately figures out which one the real one is. I think it's like the second one he hits. Um, they kind of start their fight. Then we cut back to Krang. He's got the portal going on. The turtles filter in. And basically, within like two seconds, um, he's he's turning himself even bigger and chasing them out of the out of the Technodrome. Yeah, so a whole, lot. whole yeah, lot to unpack there. there. Yeah. So maybe we go back to uh, mm-hmm. newsroom scene or or kind of April's timeline. Yeah. Um, so we, we get confirmation that it's been a week. So all this stuff, all these episodes have happened presumably like back to back days. And she, so she's kind of confirming that timeline. I do think, uh, maybe took a little aggressive path there threatening, uh, you know, burn, but, um, ultimately gets what she needs, which is the camera crew to take this whole green menace story, um, and kind of squash it and just let people know that the turtles are actually the good guys. So appreciate that going on. Um, but Splinter, the scene with Splinter and the holograms, how many times is he going to get tricked by a hologram? I mean, it's it was at least time. at least twice, you know? Um, but what happened before? Well, no, in this scene alone, like he gets oh. hologram tricked by the retro mutagen ray. You know, it was like a super sneaky, like showing Splinter, like tiptoeing over, and then he gets up to it and disappears. And then he gets tricked because he he goes for the wrong shredder originally too. So for but even even if you go back to the I think it was episode two or three where he just like walks oh, right yeah, into yeah. the, the technodrome and gets like abducted immediately. Yeah, or caught by the little uh, roadkill Rodney. So yeah. like he's not for being the leader of the turtles technically like their their master. He's kind of a bumbling idiot. Yeah, I mean he's not he's not batting a hundred or a thousand. That's for sure. Yeah. Um. But overall, I mean, yeah, he he identifies that. And as he's, uh, is this the fight scene? Or have we gotten to the fight scene yet between Splinter and Shredder? Or is that? This is, so this is where it's kind of, so it's like ongoing. So it goes, yeah. it kind of cuts back and forth in their battle. So in this, I think this first little brief scene basically ends with, with him kind of bashing Splinter with his stick. The other holograms disappear and then they kind of start their one-on-one yeah. tussle. But at this point, it's not clear who's winning or who's losing. Right. Um. So Crane, Crane chases the turtles out of the Technodrome, and then he turns even bigger, like, you know, like tens of stories high, hundreds of feet high, and then jumps up into the city. Um, presumably to destroy it, it's not really clear why he's going up there. He just kind of launches himself up into the street. Yeah, I, I, this was confusing to me because Crane was trying, when he was communicating with Dimension X and the stone soldiers stone warriors we did get a little glimpse of dimension x and it looked absolutely terrible yeah it was like red fiery inferno crate like there's 12 great 
brigades, brigades of soldiers available to start coming through. And then that's why I get confused because the turtles roll up on him and then he just like flex a bus his way up into the city to start mashing buildings. Yeah. And there was <clears throat> I, there was a, a little reference to, I think it was a Star Trek episode where as Krang is getting bigger, I think Raphael says, you know, oh my gosh, like the wrath of Krang. And then Michelangelo's like, isn't that, wasn't that a movie? Which I think is the wrath of Khan. Yeah. And then <laughs> they're like, I haven't seen that. Yeah, Leo. Like, Leo's like, yeah. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then and then it's and then it sets up for the sarcastic like Raf comment, which is, "Well, we're about to," or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, yeah. or I can't believe what I'm seeing with my eyes right now. Or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, "I don't, I don't believe that I've seen that movie." And then Raf's yeah. like, "Well, I don't believe what I'm seeing." And then Craig like busts his way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that punch, like he basically just punches up through the road. Like there's a very thin layer of cement. Yeah. 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 Which is interesting because every other Crust. time they've shown the Technodrome, it's like below the subway level. So you go below the street, not. below the subways. It's it, here. It just seems to be conveniently directly below the street level. Yeah. And in a large my void. favorite thing again is like crank punches up, he climbs up and the turtles just throw their little grapple hook, which like for all this high tech stuff they have this, like that's the extent of their, grappling capabilities they just throw it up and climb this rope slowly um yeah, incredibly accurate with it so they follow up there and then we cut back to donnie he's kind of inflating what appears to be like a giant balloon we don't know exactly what it is at this point and then we cut back to crane he's just randomly smashing buildings um and april rolls up in her in her news van so at this point it seems to be that everybody's converging back um into one big group here so we know Krang's up in the street. The turtles are dealing with him. Um, we cut back to Shredder and Splinter, kind of continuing their fight in the Technodrome. Um, it's unclear, again, who's winning. I think it's it's kind of like a back and forth. Shredder does something. Splinter kind of tackles him and, and jumps on him. And then we finally cut back to Donnie, who is zooming in on a turtle blimp um, to help out the turtles uh, in their fight with Krang. So we'll pause here. Um, we're going to do Turtle Tech one more time. This is the closing piece of Turtle Tech. Uh, blimps. John, this is, this is a layup. Were these available Absolutely. at the time? Yeah. Are you kidding me? But they've had blimps since like the Hindenburg. Yeah. Which Andrew, was... obviously you agree. So here's the real yeah. trivia question. We'll see if you guys get this. What is the difference between a blimp and a Zeppelin? John, you first. Uh, it's got to be what is in, what gas is used in the balloon. Andrew? Uh, I, I would disagree with John. I think it has, it may have something to do with like fuel source or like uh, mobility, but um, I think in general, it's just like heated air is what there is carrying these things. So I think it's Not size. In like, I think um, I think it has to do with size. Like a Zeppelin is like an SUV and a blimp is like a sedan or something like that. Like it has to do ge geometry. Um, you're both wrong. I would say <laughs> you're equally, equally wrong. Nobody was very close. So the, the difference is... A Zeppelin is a rigid structure, so there's a frame to the actual balloon portion. A blimp is just literally like a balloon filled with air. So it can be deflated and, and kind of stored together. Um, blimps, blimps came along first. Can you guys guess roughly how the, the oldest blimp design? How far does it date back? I think it goes all the way back to Da Vinci, doesn't it? Like back in the Renaissance and shit. John? Yeah, let's say it goes. Yeah, I think Da Vinci like had sketches, right? You're, so Da Vinci had sketches he of had a parachute. machine. Oh. The first kind of blimp, 1670, is the oldest known design. Yeah, by um, who? Uh, I don't know. It's like some. He was some like uh, British guy or Mr. a French guy. Mister Blimp. <laughs> when? All right, and this is kind of the last, the last trivia question tied to this. When was the first engine-powered flight? So it was a blimp-style machine. What roughly? What year was that? Uh, go first. engine power flight. When was the, um, the steam generator invented? Like the 1800s? 
steam steam engine steam engine yeah steam yeah probably generator. like late 17 early In, industrial revolution so i would say yeah like right around 1800 john i'm gonna go 1801 <laughs> <laughs> just i just <laughs> price is right your ass. <laughs> it's 1852 mm. henri giffard became the first person to make engine powered flight he flew 17 miles in a steam powered airship so basically a steam powered blimp um, and then obviously Zeppelins get their name from the German inventor of the Zeppelin, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, which mm. he perfected around the turn of the century. They were a big uh, piece of World War One. Yeah, his famous um, brother led. <laughs> <laughs> um, John was kind of getting off track with a little air. So the Zeppelins had hydrogen in them, which is why the Hindenburg went up. Um, Blimps use helium primarily, if you're curious. Still today, or is it, or is it different? Uh, still, still today, there's there's yeah. not a lot of blimps left. Obviously, the planes kind of took them out. The Goodyear blimp is probably the most famous. Um, I but, I think there's only like like less than fifteen blimps in the world. Like yeah, it's like Goodyear something stupid. Like there's like drifts around. It's yeah, the I think same it was one. like seventeen, and like six of them or seven of them are Goodyear blimps. Wow, that's I would have never have guessed that. But I yeah, actually if, like I like blimps. Like blimp would be a nice travel be like nice and smooth kind of luxurious yeah i, I well somewhere. and and you get the best view of any sports football game because you're like you know you can see everything but you can yeah. see nothing at the same time so it's like yeah, yeah whenever you're watching like a football and they're like oh let's let's get a little shot from the blimp it's like really who is this for like this was probably cool in like the seventies when it's like, whoa, look at that blimp. But now it's like, really? Yeah, because drones, you could just launch a drone up there and you can get the same thing, and you don't have to man. It's like it doesn't have it's to true. be manned. You know, and it's way cheaper. You know, like how much helium? Because that that's actually part of the issue. Uh, not helium, but like, or maybe it is helium. I don't know. Like I, I thought I read this thing about helium. There's a shortage of helium supply, yeah. and um, which is primarily a concern for the medical um like community me medical community yeah um i guess but they were saying yeah i don't know what's causing it but basically he there's a lot of helium in a blimp there's got to be a lot imagine you know what one of the funniest things to me is is when you have a little bit of helium and you just suck it in from a balloon and then you got a really <laughs> high voice Absolutely. You should imagine classic. sucking in a blimp's worth of helium. Yeah, I was going to say, like, imagine just like... I think your lungs would like explode. What is the um, volume of typical blimp? Who knows? It's a lot. It's probably... I, I'm assuming it's not pure helium. It's probably like a mixture. But still, it probably takes a lot. This says um, Goodyear is currently replacing its blimp fleet with Zeppelins. This is from 2013. <laughs> uh, that seems like a bad idea. It says the volume is um, 200, let's just call it 200,000 cubic feet. It's weird that Goodyear has a blimp fleet. How did that happen? They're just a rubber company. They make, um, yeah, rubber. It's just a strange that they would have a blimp fleet. But anyway, so Mikey, or Donnie flies in on this blimp. He kind of picks the turtles up as they're fighting Mega Krang. And then dive bombs, Krang drops. Um, who is it? Donnie, Donnie and Leo jump off and kind of climb into Krang. And then Mikey and Raph are left. The, the, basically, the glider detaches from the blimp. And they're kind of flying this glider, kind of uh, attacking Krang from the air. I thought it was funny. Um, they're trying to theorize on how to shrink Krang. And Michelangelo's like, oh, let's wash him in some hot water. That everyone's just everyone just ignores and is like this fucking guy like, <laughs> like don't even like make a comment they're just like what a stupid comment yeah I thought it was so funny though they somehow like they just know that they hop in the shoulder and they're kind of looking around in there and then Donnie's like hey there's got to be like a molecular amplifier somewhere in here he just knows it and they start yeah, to kind of he gets a strong energy reading yeah um. So they're in there. They're looking for that. We know April's down below filming. There's another cut to Splinter and Shredder fighting. Splinter kind of drumps on Shredder, and it looks like maybe he's going to win the fight. And then um, we cut back to the Turtles. Um, they they smash the molecular amplifier unit, and then Krang slowly begins to shrink down to his original size. 
Yeah, Leo is incredibly ineffective against this chip. He's just, which is like, I don't know what that thing is made of, but his sword slices yeah. basically through anything except the outer thing of this chip. So then Donnie's like, let me take this, takes his bow staff and just jabs out the, you know, the little orange crystal that's in it that's powering it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was curious, like, what, uh, I had a couple comments, like, up until this point. One, what is, what is the physics governing this molecular amplification? Because how is it, I mean, obviously this is a cartoon, but how is it that crane can tr grow and shrink? Um, but like the turtles are in there and they're like touching it, like his bow staff touches it, but somehow the turtles stay the, their normal size. Like, I don't understand. Is it just like an energy source that's like plugged in and when you unplug it, it undoes it or I don't know kind of threw uh, me for a loop because yeah. i'm like these the turtles are either going to get immediately squashed in his shoulder because how how can how do they have time to climb out i yeah. don't know but then number two i'm like how are they not somehow being impacted or at least donnie for being in direct contact but then again like the card was stable when he handed it to, Sh to shredder in the beginning so there's got to be some something i'm missing here but i thought that was interesting the other thing um that i was trying to figure out is is this is this inspired by Godzilla? Is it inspired by Ant-Man? Like there's a whole lot of things they're pulling from. Obviously we've seen uh, historically too with the Technodrome, it's very, you know, Death Starry. So that I was trying to figure out because he wasn't really destroying a whole lot. You think like be, for being that big and wanting to take down New York City, he would just be smashing everything, right? But he's kind of, I guess, you know, being, being engaged by the turtles. And then the most important thing, I think from this clip, which I was trying to get to earlier is Splinter is giving a physical and a mental beatdown to Shredder because, and I had to look this quote up. Have you guys ever heard gentle always turns away strong? So I know he said it. I, yeah. I thought it was like his own quote. I didn't know it was like, a, was he quoting something? So it, apparently there's a reference, there's a proverb in, um, you know, Proverbs 15, one, a gentle, answer turns away wrath but a harsh w word stirs up anger so he's so quoting think, the bible as he's yeah. whipping proverbs? On shredder it says uh proverbs 15 1 new international version yeah so he's quoting the bible basically yeah apparently so i've never heard of that before because i was like gentle turns away strong like where is that coming from but um yeah so like that that mental so so as they're fighting he's kind of like jabbing him with these you know you've uh, brought dishonor to the historic foot clan and all these things that he's kind of beating him up as he's physically winning the the battle so splinter while i doubted his intentions early on i mean he's still he's still the best fighter or does yeah, shredder just suck i think shredder does suck but <laughs> the turtles can't the turtles have never to this point been able to fight shredder one-on-one -on -one, right like that hasn't happened yet yeah, no, I don't even think happened. they've tried to be honest. He always yeah. runs away. No, he always runs away when they're about to. Yeah, yeah. When there's like someone else around and something's going on, right? Well, his also is like he's got to have the worst sword, or Splinter has the best staff because it's just like nothing that Sh Shredder is doing is breaking through the wooden staff that Splinter has. Yeah, it does look like a pretty gnarled, like strong. Except. Yeah, when he I like it was a walking stick, to be honest. Yeah, after yeah. the after they like a little bit later on when Splinter picks up his staff, he basically just rips it in half with his hand and like leaves a little bit on the floor afterwards. So it's like, I think Shredder's weapons are just they're like toy weapons. Why didn't he? Why didn't he just? He has the retro mutagen ray. Like what? He doesn't want to his... turn. He doesn't want to turn Splinter back yeah. into human. He wants to get the turtles, but I mean, theoretically, he could just zap, unzap, and just kind of like mess with Splinter if he wanted to. You know what I mean? Or just like I don't like. He's got these mutant. He's got these mutants everywhere. What I know that's doing? that's what I'm saying. Like when he actually could use some of the stuff, he doesn't, and it's obviously pride. clear. It might be because like he's trying to, yeah, he's trying to fight him one on one, like mano y mano. Yeah, pride cometh yeah. before the fall. Yeah, it just seems like they up. like he's incapable of combining two options together. Where it's like I have to only use the foot soldiers, I have to only use the mutants, 
Like he's just they just use one by one, and he's never like, oh, I could send mutants and foot soldiers at the same time. Yeah, or I mean, like what he tries to do here is, um, you know, he puts him in that like alien tech jail cell, basically. Yeah. So why not just immediately do that with Splinter, and then, you know, like just move along what ultimately happens anyway, like trap Splinter, the turtles come and get him, and then you can retro mutagen them. Yeah, like just hide in a dark corner with that gun and yeah. just as they're coming in, like just pop them. Yeah. It doesn't really, uh, you know, it's one hit and the thing, they go down. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, Andrew, Andrew kind of laid it out, but what happens is Crane shrinks slowly. He shrinks way slower than he grew, but he shrinks down to size. Immediately, he like radios Shredder for help because he just feels like for whatever reason, he can't take on the turtles by himself. So Shredder kind of traps Splinter in this this electric cage, runs off. Um, Splinter does this little, which I, was misleading. He starts to unscrew a floor panel. And I was like, oh, he's going through the floor, obviously. He just takes the screw and, like, breaks the, whatever is, like, generating the, the electric cage. Um, yeah, he he throws a fucking missile. of. Yeah. He unscrews <laughs> with his fingernail this, like, tiny little... Yeah. Like dirty uh, ass long yeah, yeah. flathead <laughs> screw flathead screw which he then just throws like a p to like hit the perfect spot to then undo the whole the whole yeah. electric force field it reminded me of when people would take um the tops of like soda bottles or like beer things and just like snap, snap people and then, yeah yeah shoot it yeah. was an absolute yeah it was a missile that just pinged right off the glass crystal again that was generating the shield but when he was unscrewing i was like oh i wonder if this shield is like a, a yeah. bubble you know yeah true like sphere um, so but we but around that same time too though i think before you get into the um uh the next scene chris we've got as i think as the turtles were coming down on the glider because we had raf and mikey on the glider I think we get a let's kick some shell. I wrote that down. I think it's yeah. from that scene. Um, and then right around, uh, I think it's right around when Shredder is putting Splinter in that electric force field jail cell. He says something about dining on turtle soup. Cowabunga! Right. Yeah, which is messed up because he's like, he, yeah, he says like, I'll be dining on turtle soup or something like that, which... Yeah. It's so what happens is he runs away, he shows up like instantly where the turtles are, and he just points the ray gun at them, and they essentially just give up all hope at that point. Like there's nothing they could do. And um that's when he drops the line, like, I'm gonna be dining on turtle soup, which basically means he's gonna kill him and eat him, which is yeah. terrifying. Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter style. Context. Yeah, mm -hmm. he just like yeah. he like loses it and he's like, I'm not just gonna kill you, I'm gonna eat you too. Yeah. Um yeah. So basically he shows up instantly there. The second he's about to pull the trigger, here comes Splinter, the hero. He kind of karate chops the gun with his stick. It smashes. Um, it, it like disintegrates. That's... Yeah. Yeah. And I think he actually hucks his staff. Cause I have a note in here that like Splinter, I would immediately being in New York city. Like if I was uh, the New York Mets or the Yankees or um the jets like or the giants i would immediately try to get, get this guy signed to a contract because he's throwing missiles of like little screws and he's taking whatever deformed walking stick he has but he's hucking that like a football and then obliterating this technology so yeah. he's got like he's got a cannon yeah, for, he's like a five um, tool baseball yeah. player he's yeah. got everything i was just thinking to go along with our conversation earlier uh, his walking stick should be called the walkie sticky. <laughs> <laughs> sticky walkie. Yeah, sticky walkie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he basically saves the day and then, and again, just like another comical part, like he destroys the gun. He like hops on Crane's back. Crane's arms turn into plane wings and they just fly back down into the hole. Like just fly away basically. Um which is very funny to me, just the way that all happened so quickly. Um, so they jump down the hole, and then before we get to the final scene, we'll pause right here. We're going to do a little snake draft. Because hmm. this is the end of the blimp for the episode. So 
Um, we're going to do a snake draft of the coolest or best, I guess, depending on how you want to phrase it, um, cartoon and movie vehicles. Since we get the blimp introduced here, obviously we had the turtle van before. I'm going to say those are off limits. Obviously, we can't draft either of those. Um, we'll do, who do you guys want to do, three rounds again or four? Three. Three. And then we'll, we'll do, you can do an honorable mention. Andrew will go first because he clearly lost last week's by picking seatbelts. Um, John, you can go second. I'll go mm. last. All right. So just uh, just to clarify, because I have a I have a lot written down here. So these are just um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like historic vehicles cool. of any sort of format, whether it's a movie, cartoon. Yeah. It just um, can't be like a standard like actual yeah. vehicle. It's got to be somewhat like creative. Yeah. So. Um, so I'll go, my number one will be uh, the DeLorean from Back to the Future because Classic. I feel like the DeLorean, while it is a real car, like that movie still makes that vehicle like live in, in infamy because yeah, it was... it was like a famously failure of an actual vehicle. But yeah. That's but, like the only reason anybody knows what that car is. Yeah. So I, I got to go DeLorean. I, I've travel, never seen cool. any of Back to the Future. I don't know what it's about. <clears throat> that's for another day, John. I feel like that's just before you're in my age, John. Like Andrew's age, you're the last people that actually like. Yeah, and I, honestly, I didn't. I've only watched like parts of it. I've never watched the whole first one, but everyone knows the DeLorean and like the yeah. flux capacitor and like yeah, all that. Yeah, so it's a 1988 or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. So or go 88 miles an hour. So I'm coming out swinging. I'm going DeLorean number one. Okay. That's a good pick. That redeems your seatbelt pick. It does have seatbelts though. So I mean, <laughs> I've got yeah, I've got I've got a couple of categories. I think I'm gonna go the ecto-1 ghostbusters oh, car that was oh, my pick nice yeah just like a classic like it was i i was doing a little bit of cool. research on it yeah it was yeah. just, it just like cool. a cool thing like it was a it was modeled after an actual car that was just made into almost like a limo but just like a cool looking hey let's go catch some ghost ecto-1 that's my yeah. pick that's a really cool car that would have been number one pick um, yeah, I like that. That wasn't on my list, but it should have been because that definitely deserves to. I'm going to go with another. This is just an iconic vehicle. You see it everywhere. We're going with the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Mm. Just a giant hot dog rolling down the road. Um, apart from its looks, there's really nothing too crazy about it, but it is just one of the coolest looking vehicles. Everybody knows it. So I'm going to go Oscar Mayer Wienermobile number one. That's such a predictable answer. And by Chris, because you, as a kid, was obsessed with the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. I had a remote control Wiener yeah. Mobile. Mm. And it's the you, coolest thing. Did you know I've I've seen the Wiener Mobile in San Diego? This was like a probably a decade ago, and then I was physically next to and saw and looked inside the one that was in Kansas City. That's awesome. So I, What's the inside? Just like a lounge area. It's yeah, kind of like they use it for PR and like, obviously they give away hot dogs and stuff. Um, cause it was parked and like serving food, but it, it's really small. Like the interior, obviously the, the hot dog and the Wienermobile looks big, but the practical functional use inside is not very big. Yeah. I, I, I do have to say Oscar hot dogs are garbage. They're the worst. Yeah. Yep. Are they? I don't, <laughs> I don't like them. Um, all right. My next pick, you, I don't know if you guys are going to remember this one. So this was from a cartoon from my childhood, the Richard Scary, Busy World of Richard Scary, the Apple car. Oh yeah, yeah. The worm drives just a cool again. Looks cool. It's an apple. It can also fly. I believe it's a helicopter. Um, the little leaf twists up top. So just again, a little cool, just a cool vehicle to drive around. You could fly, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I like I like that as well. That's kind of a um, maybe a sleeper in, in the running here, but. Because it's a one person, it's a one person vehicle, right? Just for the worm. Yeah, I mean, we, it's, yeah. it's hard to tell what. There's not a lot of room, so I'm assuming it's just yeah. a one person vehicle. But it's like, and it's like half windshield, so I don't know if it's the safest thing, but hmm. it just looks sweet. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I've got a couple here that I think I, there's a whole category that I know I can leave to the last pick, but I think what I'm going to go with number two is the Batmobile. Which version? Yeah, so I th I think it's going to be like not the one from the Dark Knight that was like the tumbler that was like a Lamborghini yeah. that. No, I'm just going like original Batmobile that was like with the really long hood that you sort of get yeah. in and you're going like the Richard Burton Yeah. um yeah, Batman Forever version. Yeah, just like That's real cool, cool high-tech cool car. 
I think the coolest uh, Batmobile is a good one. I think the coolest version though is uh the Lego Batman Batmobile, which is kind of it's like kind of in the movie. dark Dark Knight vein. Yeah, it is a great movie. But uh, yeah, John, I think the one you're talking about is like from the '89 mm. uh movie with like the really long yeah front end. The '60s the end. one is cool too, like the Adam West Batman. I don't know if you guys have seen that one, but that one's pretty sweet too. So, yeah, That's no. a good pick. I had it on my list. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is where I this is where it's tough because I've got a lot of good ones here. So I'm gonna go for iconic or what? What was the what was the topic again? I said just or coolest question? or like cool. Best. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I'm gonna have to say the mystery machine from uh, Scooby Doo. I think it's pretty cool. Like shaggy wagon. Yeah, yeah. While it's not while it's not like a real big piece of that cartoon it's very iconic looking and the colors are great and it's very like hippie you know like you know 60s kind of theme so i'm gonna go mystery machine yeah vans like need to make a comeback the 60s yeah. and 70s big big van era yeah mm. and then i've got the last one here so this this one this one was a little tricky for me because i was stuck between two here and i'll i'll do the last one for my honorable mention because i don't know if it's legit but i'm gonna go the flint mobile the flintstones um Flame. the flintstones it's uh, iconic it is iconic you have to pedal with your feet yeah yeah that's the og buddy og <laughs> no so i don't even know like it's unclear how it steers too because it's got like two rigid axles that aren't able to turn yeah but the flintstones, like, uh, i mean it's like hard to beat it, it's probably the most iconic car out of all of them a rudimentary what is it, like a steam what is it a roller yeah it was kind steam of like roller? a is that what it's called yeah it has like the two steamroller wheels yeah they just call yeah. them rollers now they don't use steam yeah so i've so for my three delorean mr machine the flint mobile is that what it's called the flint i think there's like a name is it the flint I, I, mobile? I looked it up yeah that's what it said online interesting okay so i i've got a couple things here are we considering like the Millennium Falcon to be a car, no, or a vehicle to be picked. No, no, you can't okay. pick any Star Wars stuff. Yeah, good. Yeah, because I wasn't going to pick those. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> so I, I think what I'm going to go and and something I hadn't thought about originally, but something someone said just inspired it. I think I'm going to go the Magic School Bus driven by Miss Valerie Frizzle. I had that on the list. I yeah. wasn't a big Magic School Bus guy, but it is. It's pretty it's legendary. Bus. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a great one, actually. I think it's like you can time travel. With, I mean, it's magic. It shrinks, so. it grows. Yeah. It like can change yeah. forms. It's yeah. very, yeah, very flexible. And it's the cool school bus that has the nose and not the flat front ones, which looks stupid. Yeah. That's a I also think, factor. I think Miss Frizzle is like a, a queer icon now. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's true. Is she? I didn't know she was queer uh, at all. I thought, sure. I thought she was related to Mary Poppins because, like, to me, those characters are almost the same where they're like, I, I've never seen Mary Poppins, but I feel like it's very educational or yeah. like something. I don't know. Mary Poppins like just flies with an umbrella. That's all I know about her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she's got like an endless purse too or something, doesn't she? Like where she just keeps yeah, pulling like stuff out of the bag. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's not a bad pick. All right. My last pick to wrap this up. Um, kind of torn. I'm going to go with this is kind of another obscure one, but if we're just going on what looks cool. I'm going with RC from Toy Story, the RC car. Yeah. Again, RC's just a really nice. cool looking little car. He's super fast. Um, plays a crucial part at the end when they're chasing the truck. But we also cool, have this toy. It's just a cool, just a cool looking race car. So I'm gonna go with RC. Yeah, I'm a big RC fan. I almost went uh Lightning McQueen just because yeah. I mean he's, he's pretty I like iconic. He's, and, he's iconic, oh, but there's other there's cooler cars in that movie. Yeah, I just like uh, is that Owen Wilson that does his voice? Yeah, yeah. I just like I'm a big Chain. Owen Wilson fan. Yeah, so I like wow. That. Uh, honorable mentions, Andrew. <laughs> if you want to know for years, we'll go in order here. Yeah, I had a couple here. Uh, a lot of them I didn't think were legit. Like Optimus Prime, I put because he technically is a vehicle. Very you know, Transformers were mm. legendary. He's like a Mack truck, right? Is that yeah, Bumble Bumblebee is a cooler. He's the Mustang, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I had the flying car and the Jetsons. Yep. I had that just as like the most iconic, like futuristic glass dome bubble yeah. car. Yeah. yeah. Um, I already mentioned um, Lightning McQueen. And then I had, uh, since Chris has been dropping all these Power Rangers, Megazord. 
Yeah, who's kind of like a knockoff, like transformer, the, right? Yeah, like what's the when Optimus Prime comes together with all the other ones? What's it called? Megatron. Is that a no, Megatron? No, Optimus Prime. No, it's a, I think it's an Optimus mm-hmm. Prime ripped off, rip off. Because I didn't know they all joined together. I thought the Transformers only transformed into like their form. I didn't know they could combine. Oh, maybe I'm just confusing yeah. Power Rangers then. I don't I know. Just assume they all joined together to make one big guy. Yeah, but most of those I didn't think were legit because like Optimus Prime, while he is a vehicle, he's actually an alien like life form. So, yeah. it, you know, taking shape of a human vehicle. So, yeah, that's mine. I, I kind of went with nostalgia a little bit. Um, what I thought was big. Like, I, I feel like the Flintstones were a pretty legendary cartoon. Uh, DeLorean in Back to the Future was pretty legendary. And then I just like the Mystery Machine. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, I was going to, the couple of else that I had on my list, one was the General Lee. Uh, yeah. Which That's kind of been like canceled. Like That's been canceled, though, right? I know. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah, I, know. I know. But Dixie, yeah. John, what? <laughs> John just loves it. He just had to bring it up. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what is the Knight Rider? Is that what yeah, like, the, the car. futuristic car that people That's have? Yeah. David Hasselhoff. Um, yeah, and then on my list, I definitely didn't have the Y Wing, ATAT Walkers, or the Starship <laughs> Enterprise weren't on my list either. So, um, mine just to go through them, I had the Blues Brothers, the Blues Mobile. It's my favorite movie, um, which is basically just a cop car with a loudspeaker on the top. I had Cruella Deville's car from Hundred One Dalmatians. I had the, the cartoon, Dumb- the cartoon Dumb- or the movie, the cartoon, not the movie. Um, Dumb and Dumber's dog van, that one's awesome. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. I had the two Jurassic oh, yeah. Park vehicles, the Jeep and the SUV, because those just look cool. Um, and I had the Pizza Planet delivery truck from Toy Story 2. The one that just says toy on the back, and it's got like the little rocket on the roof. You know which one would have been a sleeper I just thought of now? Is uh, the Winnebago from Spaceballs. Oh, yeah. That thing was cool, right? That. that is a good one. Yeah, that would have been good. Um, That's a good one. All right. So to close out the episode, um, so Shredder jumps on Krang's back. They fly down the hole. The turtles pursue them. Um, and basically they're in the portal room. So the turtles come in, they rush in, and within like five seconds have basically not only turned the portal off, but reversed it to suck in Krang, Shredder, and the entire Technodrome itself, just in time for them to kind of jump out and land on the ground. Um, the it cuts to Dimension X. We see Shredder and Crane kind of waking up in there. Um, you know, Crane is like very happy and ecstatic that he's back. He's ready to conquer his old dimension. Shredder is obviously upset. He doesn't want to be there because in this dimension, Crane is the boss and he's kind of subservient to Crane. Um, the turtles realize that. You know, now that the Technodrome has been destroyed, Splinter can't convert himself back because the ray gun got uh, crushed, which Splinter seems to be okay with. Um, and then yeah, he, the calls episode, it, he calls it karma. <laughs> yeah. The episode closes with April's news story on the Turtles, which paints them as friends. Um, and then we kind of get like a funny interview where like she goes, you know, the public's not fully convinced if they're friend or foe. We see the old lady from episode one that was pushing yeah. like the shopping cart, kind of tearing them apart. It had the Uzi. Yeah, yeah. It had the like, it, yeah, the assault rifle that it whipped out. Yeah. And then we get a, another interview with these people. I think they're wearing like shirts that just say turtles or whatever. Turtle um, power. Yeah. They're obviously pro turtle. Um, and then it kind of closes out with the turtle celebrating, but. Splinter reminding them, you know, hey, I don't think we've seen the last of Krang and and Splinter or uh, Shredder. You know, enjoy this while you can, but they're probably going to come back at some point. Yeah, a little classic foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, so, I mean, I mean, overall, what uh, what do we think of the ending to uh, season one? So it's like, all all yeah, Donnie first. all Donnie did to reverse the portal was take the chips out and turn them around to be like. <laughs> I guess he's just so smart. He knows all he has to do to reverse the portal is just flip around everything. Yeah, yeah literally just, reverse the portal. Change the polarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So What's I that? thought it was like, it felt like the episode was like, they almost rushed to end it at the end there. Like yeah. there's all this long drawn out stuff to get them to battle in the street. And then when it comes to the actual portal, in like five seconds, they've just turned it around. Everybody's been sucked in and then the episode ends. So to me, it kind of felt like the end got rushed a little bit. Mm. 
But it was like when Shredder's in Dimension X is a very, he's just like, no, like, I don't want to be here. This is crap. And then he ends up taking off the, yeah. his mask so that you get to see his full face for the time. He's got a pretty chiseled jawline. I'm not going to lie. No facial hair either. He's just yeah. clean shaven. Like you yeah. think you'd hide a beard behind that because nobody's looking at his <laughs> face, but yeah. <laughs> he's, yeah. I just think it's funny that like, there's no rule. Like Krang is just like, yeah, I'm the boss now. Like you have to do what I say. Like, there's no rules to anything. Yeah. But it, like Krang's just all of a sudden like, all right, I'm, I'm in charge now. So I, I also thought it was interesting that like Krang mentions like, now is the time where I can reconquer my dimension. When it seemed like he what like he had already conquered it. I know they're at war, but like the picture that gets painted of Krang is that he was like the overlord of this dimension anyway. Yeah, I thought more about that. I think in my mind, what makes sense, like that story wise, is like he was the overlord, but some there was like an uprising, he got banished, and then it threw the Dimension X into chaos. So he's been wanting to get back to Dimension X to re reclaim it. Like he he doesn't really care about the turtles other than they've now kind of uh messed up his plans to get to dimension x or to overtake earth because remember like back early on like he actually helped the turtles in episode two or whatever it was or episode three he helped mikey defeat splinter or uh defeat shredder and so to me like it's it's kind of a bittersweet ending because crane gets what he wants we uh shredder's denied once again defeating the turtles um but we assume that they'll be back because they're, you know, the only real bad guys that we've, we've been fighting or that the turtles have been fighting now for the first, first season here. So True. yeah, a whole lot of stuff. We get a shred head drop to by Mikey at one point, Calabunga! which shred head is like the, a nickname that definitely sticks around for, for shredder from the turtles. Um, Shredhead. I, uh, I kind of chuckled at the, reversal of the dimension x portal you know when it uh goes from i guess in my in my head i remember that scene from space balls that they mentioned like going from suck, suck to, to blow, blow. yeah <laughs> so in my head i kind of was thinking about that that's why i thought of the the uh the winnebago but uh yeah i mean if i were crane i think that's a win in his book i mean it was pretty messy but getting back to dimension x was his ultimate goal so kind of see interested to see how that all plays out yeah, I agree. John, anything? Yeah, no, that was summed up well. Perfect. So I guess to wrap up the episode, we'll do one final do it. Let's start with the adjustment to the um the villain rankings if we feel it's needed. I personally think we need to tweak them a little bit based on the episode. Yeah, so just um I'll share my screen, but just to recap for everyone uh, listening or just joining. Um, so we, we rank the villains as they appear and then we adjust them as, uh, as needed. So from last episode, this, this is the villain power rank we have from first to last is Roadkill Rodney's, the Mausers, the uh, Krang, Shredder, General Trag and Granitor, the Punks, Baxter Stockman, Bebop and Rocksteady, and then the Foot Soldiers in last. So I'm going to share the screen. We'll move stuff around. Any, um, anyone who wants to start, Chris, John? Uh, yeah. So I'll, so obviously no new villains this episode. I think we need to move Krang up the list here. So Krang. I... Yeah. Why you disagree, John? No, 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 I agree. I'm just going to say I'm out on the roadkill Rodney's and the Mousers. Oh, I think you think he should go to the top. I'm just, they haven't been around. Yeah, you're saying because they, like, they haven't yeah. been prevalent. Just they're, an activity. I just yeah, think I just, one of those things, it's like, do you get punished for not for not playing a game? Yeah, I mean, like the biggest part of it, like if they're so effective, then why wouldn't they be used more? Like they're just, like what Like what did the, the road kills, what? Just because they caught uh, Splinter like a couple the, times? The road kills basically, net, like they always did their job. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they're not doing much lately. Yeah, I don't, I don't think know, they like, ever. No, um, they, they should ever, be penalized for not being used. They should be used more. They were the most successful. I'm just saying, if they're they better, have. then they would. They should be used more. I mean, I think we can move the mousers down. You gotta let the so, big dogs eat. So Crane, like this, to me, Crane gets bonus points because a, he's been given a body which clearly makes him more powerful. 
he can grow, he can shrink. Um, he like he wasn't, I guess, successful in opening the portal and bringing his guys back. But like he, he also didn't have a major loss, I would say. And he he ultimately, as a villain, like his whole ploy was to get back to Dimension X, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like so, no matter, yeah, it's like one of those things where it's like to the ends just by the means. At the end of the day, he got what he wanted. So it doesn't matter how he got there. Yeah. I think Crane's at the top, personally. I'm I'm fine if we want to move Crane that that far up. All right, let's move it. I think Shredder's the interesting one. Does he go up or down based on this episode? I think I think he goes up. You think up? I yeah, think he goes I do. down. I think he goes down. He didn't I was gonna say down. Yeah. I don't think he achieved anything. He he lost his fight. Well, I mean, you could argue he lost his fight to Splinter. At the end, he trapped him in a, in a cage. So maybe that counts as a win. But he, like at the end of the day, he's basically demoted at this point. He's gone from first in charge to second in charge. I mean, he does beat Splinter, but then he loses because he gets sucked into Dimension X and he doesn't actually retro mutagen shoot any of the turtles. But does he like, I, does he like, he. So he tricks Splinter. That's a plus, right? He gets him in. He tricks him with the hologram. Mm-hmm. He gets his butt whooped, and then like wins. On, he's like saved by the bell. He just throws like an electric cage over him. But he, I feel he like he made the body for Krang. Yeah, I mean, in you know half a day, he made the, the best feature of the body is Krang telling him to put that chip in. Like without that chip, Krang is just. Yeah. He's just another goon. But he had the foresight to put an adapter for that chip. <laughs> so you think where? So where do you think Shredder goes above? You'd put him in second. Well, yeah. Again, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but like I said, I'm out on the road kills and the mousers. I think four episodes of an activity just gets you down. The road kills were in episode two and three, weren't they? Uh, they cut Bebop and Rocksteady out of the zoo. Yeah, whatever that episode was. I mean, the Royal Kill writings do not return, at least through season seven. Oh, jeez. Uh, All right. We're going to this down. Yeah. <laughs> they don't, don't ever come back? Like, how is that a thing? And the Mausers. The thing they have. They're yeah, like a the, main villain in the video game, too. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the Mausers, I don't think, come back either. Like, I'm in season eight now, and I haven't seen them. How do we get the Mausers so high? They kind of sucked too. Because they, they destroyed the buildings. <laughs> they chased everyone around. Like they could heat seek like everybody. Oh, they did. They yeah, did they get found the turtles like immediately. Just yeah. True. I'm just out on them both. It's interesting that the two most effective things never come back. Yeah. Well, that's why, right? Um, Shredder just like to me sucks. I, I mean, I would say like General Trag and Granitor, like they amassed an army in Dimension X waiting. They came through, were about to blast shit away and then before donnie reversed the portal so i'm like i'm i'm still in on the stone warriors trag and granitor do you think they're well we had them below shredder do you think and you think shredder improved so john think, basically has shredder second after crane yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah i'd say that bebop also i think bebop and rocksteady shot up the leaderboard yeah i think well. those guys go up i think Foot, shoulder, foot soldiers stay where they are because they just got yeah. carried out on a sewage. If you get poop sewage. on your head, you're automatically bottom. <laughs> yeah, I so, think Bebop and Rocksteady go up below the, the stone soldiers. Yeah, I think that the question is, so John's saying Shredder goes up. The, these two come down, basically. Roquel Rodney's and Mauser's come down to the bottom. But you're going to put them below the, the foot punks. soldiers? No, I, mean, I, put them, I put them above the punks. You put them up Below Bebop and Rocksteady? Yeah. Wow. See, I still think they're above Bebop and Rocksteady because they yeah. just keep screwing up. I agree. I mean, Shredder, I'm moving to number two. So we got Krang, Shredder. Where were Bebop and Rocksteady in the final battle? They're still in the concrete, buddy. Once they get buried in, in concrete, they're done. Yeah, they're done for the episode. But they don't, don't they end yeah. up in Dimension X? <laughs> yeah, I think they, they do. <laughs> I think they do. If, if they're just if, if they're just like in, in the, cement, the like whole infirmary in the Technodrome. So I was gonna say if there's just in cement for the full episode, then they're bottom. Absolutely. <laughs> like if you get how how fast does does concrete dry? You'll die if you're. It'll burn your skin. 
what about a the skin of a rhino? Yeah, it dry. It basically removes all the moisture and then heats up. It gets hot when it cures. If you're if you're covered like that, you like legitimately die. Well, they are yeah. mutants, so and they're massive, yeah. so. But I would say, to me, I think they. I think it goes Crane, Shredder, Stone Warriors, mm -hmm. Roadkill, Mousers, then Bebop and Rocksteady. Yeah, I could agree with that. Yeah, all right, I'm on board. With and that. then we can debate if we take, you know, like if it's not a recurring villain, you know, do they make the board or do we have like an honorable mention where it's like, I'm I'm you know. fine if we leave them on. It's just if they continue to not do things, it should be like the like you know in like the the tournament or like the top twenty five in college sports where they're like you know outside the top twenty five but receiving votes. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's like how we that. do. I mean, we still have. There's definitely going to be more villains that come in season two, so we've got time to kind of figure that out. But overall, I feel pretty comfortable with this power ranking where we've got Krang number one, Shredder number two. General Dragon, Granitor number three, Royal Kill Rodney's number four, Mauser's number five, Bebop and Rocksteady number six, The Punks number seven, Baxter Stockman number eight, and then the Foot Soldiers rounding it out at nine. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think honestly, even though like like Bebop and Rocksteady have have made progress, they've roughed up the turtles twice now. Yeah, the sneak attack like they snuck up on them pretty They're easily. so good at just grabbing people from behind by the shoulders and tossing yeah. them in the walls. Yeah, and then it kind of unravels from there. But yeah, they, they, they know what their fastball is, and they use it. Yeah. Cool. All and right. Listen, so that's... they follow orders. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good goon just doing what they're told. Yeah. And they're strong. I mean, we forget they're mutants. Like they're whipping cars around. Like we we talked last episode about the turtles pushing the turtle van up, but we in a single scene was it either Bebop or Roxy? They just pick up like a red sedan and just huck mm -hmm. it at the turtles you know i think it was it was um bebop because rock said he was just shooting like his laser gun everywhere like yeah in, in they town. need a little target practice yeah. with the laser guns yeah all right cool so that close out villain power ranking what's next chris i think it's just the pizza pizza time pizza time, pizza time? cool pt baby this is me right yeah we're gonna get some pizzas back on the wheel I know we're getting low. So again, just remind uh, listeners at home. So every episode that a pizza, you know, unique, weird pizza is mentioned, we've been adding it to uh, this this uh, wheel of names uh, spinner here. So the idea is every episode, one of us spins a wheel, gets a sign of pizza that we then eat at the beginning of the episode. So Chris, so uh, joyously ate his raisin bran pizza. Later this episode, John's up next, uh, and John is required to make a real pizza, not <laughs> some yeah. bougie, like, made-up Gordon Ramsay fucking thing. So the good thing is that we're down to, like, the there's not a lot of, like, quote-unquote normal stuff left. Like, there's really just the yeah. weird stuff at this point. I mean, sausage. Oh, okay, so let me go through what's left on the board here. So we've got cornflakes, sashimi, uh, mushroom and jelly bean, peanut butter, and... Anchovy, anchovy slash sardine and then um sausage and banana. banana so most of these are from like episode two i think episode one one the only one from two is cornflakes yeah cornflakes cool john's right. gonna get cornflakes he has good luck i can see yeah what do you want and what do you want and what do you don't want john i really don't want sashimi really i just don't like i don't want to go through the hassle of having to buy a fish Really, because the tuna if quality. I'm being honest, any fish, the it's gonna be tuna so grade. there's a stop and shop down the street, and the seafood guy there is just like dirty. I don't want to deal with him. Yeah, no disrespect to him, but I mean prepackaged what sashimi? They don't do well, that at that stop and shop. They make it and put it in the cooler. Sashimi is not like a fish; it's a style of eating. It's a it's a sashimi's raw preparation. Fish. It's a preparation yeah. of yeah. yeah. It, so you can just get it from a sushi place, order sashimi, and stick it on a pizza. Yeah, you're making this more difficult. <laughs> you're not. Like, you're not the sushi chef. I hope he gets. I hope he gets that just so we can see. But which one? Um, so that's the one you don't want. Which one are you hoping for? Uh, I don't know. I, I think the other four are fine with cornflakes. I feel like we're 
like I'm out on the cereal pizza because you guys are being dinks about the cookie dessert pizza. All right. Well, let's uh, let's make it happen. Let's see what's been goes. Click the wheel, baby. And now it's spinning. So we got whatever those were, like six options, I think, five options. And ooh, stop on this one. Yeah, John has peanut Here butter and sardines ooh. or anchovies. That's actually the one I wanted. Wow. Good luck with that, John. I think yeah. I can I think I can do some. I feel like mixing a little bit of the peanut butter with the sauce. Yeah. <laughs> question is do you go smooth or crunchy peanut butter smooth i might go crunchy because there's definitely gonna be crunchy and sardines so like in my mind i'm like oh that's just the peanuts it's anchovies sure. it's not sardines by the way whatever it's very it's clear similar. they're very similar it's, fish no no if i'm it, a sardine is like the, is it's what that photo is right there small it, oily salty fish no is what you're eating i googled whatever he said in the episode and announced the picture that anchovy is anchovy anchovies are very different than sardines in terms of like all right well you can educate us next week on all the nuances of sardines i don't think versus... they are i think they're similar john's just thinking of like a canned anchovy versus a fresh yeah. sardine yeah well no i'm saying like what you would buy as a sardine in a can are you gonna go candy or are you gonna go fresh where the fuck am I going to get a fresh sardine? <laughs> You're in Boston. There's seafood Yeah, stores. seafood place. I'm not going to go get a... Like, if I was just complaining about sashimi, I'm not going to go buy a fresh sardine. Well, so here's here's the breakdown, John. Anchovies are slightly smaller in size and have dark reddish gray flesh. Sardines are larger and have white flesh. All I'm saying is you can take an anchovy and make it... It's basically just like a salty thing. Yeah, sardine, sardine is, sardine is less yeah, it's less intense though. So anchovy anchovies are are smaller but more intense. Basically what it comes down to. So you walked yeah. out that you got sardines. Anchovies. Oh, it's anchovies? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's anchovies and peanut butter. So it's I mean it's like sweet and salty. Although we have we only have the natural, like Teddy's natural peanut butter. That's Home, the home to Everett Mass, you know. Well, All right, well, we'll got. see. We'll see. Either way, it's got to be on an actual pizza. It can't just be like dessert pizza or yeah. breakfast pizza or whatever. We'll see. Who Nobody knows. A cheese, it's just take a cheese. You have to take a cheese pizza. And add the and stuff add, onto you it. You can't make a pizza out of these things. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> the intent is that they're just eating like a regular cheese pizza with these toppings. John's trying, I can see his brain trying yeah. to find a loophole in the Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just like it's like if 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 say beer pizza was an option Old here. Beer pizza. Think about that. Would we be able to use the monstrosity that we made you know nine ten years ago? That was the worst pizza I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Beer yeast. <laughs> On the grill, and then you grill <laughs> the dough. Yeah. <laughs> It was the it most my best hoppy work. ass pizza that I've ever had in my life. Yeah, I probably should have pulled it from a non uh, IPA batch. <laughs> it, was like, it was like licking an empty beer bottle. It was gross. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't don't ever use your beer yeast to make pizza dough. That's just. And maybe yeah. it's fine, but the ratio is way off. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, weren't good. But either way, well, you still gotta put these toppings on a cheese pizza yeah and we'll open that's actually a good way to open season two episode one is probably what would be the most controversial pizza toppings that we had on the wheel so no much jelly, jelly bean and mushroom i think it would be worse uh i think most people are grossed out by anchovies unless unless you get like cheese flavored jelly beans from yeah. jelly belly yeah or like popcorn. that wouldn't be allowed Those don't either. exist they don't i just ate a whole bag of they don't have cheese flavor <laughs> I'm sure or like those weird um, Harry Potter ones that are like yeah, vomit. Yeah, pretty bots, every flavor beans. And like farts and stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, any any um, any hopes, any any wishes for season two? Any Anything you're looking forward to or hoping happens? Chris? John, you want to go? All right, me? Um, yeah. yeah, I think, which they kind of got toward it toward the end. Like now they've set each turtle's personality. So like Donnie, the last two episodes has done more inventing 
Um, Leo's kind of been the obvious leader. So I'm, I'm interested to see, honestly, mostly like what, what Donnie invents. That's been my favorite part so far, all the little inventions they do. Hmm. And then Connor. I guess how Cal Crane and, and Shredder get back to Dimension X and how fast. Because right now, like all we know about the turtles is they exist. I guess the, the only the only reason they're fighting is like Shredder. We we're not aware that they were fighting anybody before. So like how do other villains pop up in the absence of Shredder? Yeah. Yeah, now that there's yeah. a, a void at the top of the uh the villain villain yeah, power exactly. struggle. Yeah. Yeah, that was what I was going to say is mostly just who are the new characters that are going to get introduced um, and what antics will ensue. So, Yeah, yeah. for me, I mean, I've watched uh, season two. I, at this time, like going back, watching it for the first time, I was, I was interested to see who the other villains, you know, because there's a big TMNT like universe. So uh, which villains came in and then also just, switching up their story because like the krang and shredder thing is obviously the the main plot here like the the battle of good versus evil between the turtles and them but it kind of gets old after a while and so here like i feel good the way season one's ending but i'm hopeful to you know kind of have different plots kind of pull in and as chris mentioned the characters develop a little bit more yeah like for example the cheese monster things like where do the where when do those come in? That's what like is that next season? And you don't monsters. don't share, but yeah, like I don't even you know, know what you're talking about. You know, from like the video P- game where pizza you're surfing monsters. in Yeah, you're surfing in the sewer and they've got the pizza monsters that are there. No, I don't even remember that. I know exactly what you're talking about. It kinda look like monsters. like you've seen the movie Alien or know what the villain looks like. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things. Yeah. yeah. Those are pizza monsters? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, that happens soon because I can't remember because season three is so long. Um, but I think we get a lot of good stuff in season two because this one's like 25 episodes or something like that, somewhere in the 20s. So we'll get that. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, looking forward to the villains. I'm a big Rat King fan. Big Rat King yeah, fan. Yeah, I'm interested to see when he comes in. It's yeah. like, I feel like they would walk because they always like show rats in the background when they're in the sewer. And I always think that's going to be the episode he pops in. Yeah, but I, I guess we'll see him in season two. So with that being said, we'll wrap up this episode and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone. Cowbunga.